Please be seated. Well, grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm glad to be with you after a bit of a break. Um, allow me to, to share with you that my mother's 95th birthday went very well. Uh, as I told the folks at 830, all five of the kids sat down at the same table. No fisticuffs. No food was thrown. We made it all the way through dinner. Uh, and uh, it was just a, a wonderful time together uh, for us as a family. Uh, last weekend, we had our son Nathan's wedding. Uh, and that was a, a great joy to have everyone together. They are married and enjoying uh, moving into, into life together. This past week, uh, Nathan celebrated his 30th birthday. I texted him and I said, 30 and married? It's like you're a real grown-up now. <laughs> so, but it is great to be back with you uh, and to be in your midst. Uh, the Reverend Carol Gehring is with us uh, this week and will be coming down with, uh, with her husband David shortly, apparently. Uh, as uh, they prepare uh, to, to share with us uh, as a part of our 250th celebration. Uh, certainly call your attention to all of the announcements that are in the bulletin, particularly in regard to all of the activities for children and youth around Vacation Bible School and the mission trip and all of the other activities as we move into these, uh, into these summer months. Uh, yes, sir. Things will cool off in just a couple of minutes. <laughs> All right, there you go. So it'll cool off in just a couple of minutes. Um, uh, allow me to share with you that on Wednesday, uh, uh, Michael and Dave and I and uh, uh, Deb uh, Debbie Hunter and Julie Brinson will go to Greenville to take part in our, uh, in our annual conference gathering. I certainly hope that you will hold that in your thoughts and prayers. If we could, let's have a word of prayer right now. God of all life, God of all love, you have spoken to us through the word. You send your spirit to hold us, and as a father, you care for us. Grant that we may worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this day and always. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and continue our time of praise. Ghost in the fire, your holy flame burning wild, burning through the night, burning with the light of a billion stars. Love is my light, it's cracking through the sky. Yes. 
Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of Proverbs from the 8th chapter. Does not wisdom call, and does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at, a cro at the crossroads she takes her stand. Beside the gates in the front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she cries out. To you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all that live. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts long ago. Ages ago, I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields or the world's first bits of soil. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the human race. This morning's epistle lesson comes from the book of Romans, the fifth chapter. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Be God. Uh, let's continue our uh, time with children's sermon. There we go. I, I, I blanked out because I was like, uh-oh, I didn't do a children's sermon for it's this me. week. I thought it was you. Welcome. Thank you. Everybody. We have any children? Come on up front. <laughs> right. Good morning. Okay. So. For those who don't know me, my name is Miss Ashley, and I am going to make this fish move across the paper without touching the fish. Do you think I can do it? Yes. yes. You think I? Whoa! <laughs> I'm glad y'all have faith in me. All right. I know how to move it. Shh, you can't tell them. Did I move it? Is it moving? Oh, that's pretty cool, isn't it? It is a magnet. I just got a great smart group of kids here. So I did. I don't, I don't have any special powers. I wish I did. But I used a magnet. magnet to do it. Now, you couldn't see the magnet. You guys are really smart and you knew it was there. But you couldn't see the magnet, but you could see the power of it moving the fish across the paper. And just like this magnet that you can't see, we have power within us. Our power is called the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus decided it was time to leave earth and go back to heaven, he told the disciples that he was going to leave the Holy Spirit with them to help them live inside of them and help them make choices every day. Now, if we believe in Jesus, we also have the Holy Spirit in us. And just like you can't see the magnet, you can't see the Holy Spirit, in us but you can feel its power and just like the power of the magnet that moves the fish the holy spirit helps us make guides us through our every day and helps us make choices so for example if you're at school and you see someone who looks lonely or sad the holy spirit might guide you to go over and do what how could you them to play. yes you could ask them do they want to play you could talk to them and the closer we are to Jesus, the more that we feel the Holy Spirit. All right, can we pray? God, thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to guide us in the way you want us to go. Help us to stay close to you so that we can feel the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. Amen. All right, if you 
would like to go up to Scent Kids, you can follow Miss Sydney and I. Please remain standing, if you're able to, for the reading of today's gospel from the book of Romans. Peace and joy. Oh. <laughs> Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. This ends the reading. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. It's our good pleasure to welcome, uh, as I said, the Reverend Carol Gehring uh, to be with us this morning. Uh, David and Carol served here from 1996 to 2001. Um, I, I told that the earlier service, one of the longstanding stories in my family comes from the first contact I had with, uh, with David and Carol. They were here at Centenary, uh, and I called... Uh, to invite them, uh, invite Carol to be a part of a Walk to Emmaus event. She said no, she couldn't do it uh, because they were getting ready to celebrate their 25th anniversary and their children were sending them to Hawaii for a two-week vacation. 
I immediately went home and began telling that story to our children with great frequency. When our 25th wedding anniversary came, I think we got a card, but I'm not even totally sure we got that. Over the years, uh, Carol and David and I have crossed paths in a number of ways. I have come to know both of them as, as good friends and, most of all, as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. Carol? Good morning. Good morning. You know, I'm seeing some of your faces and remembering great things that we've shared and done and I'm sorry, I just walked in a few minutes ago. I got so excited talking to people upstairs, I just lost track of time. And I guess you know how that goes. But thank you for letting me come and be a part of this time of worship with you, a time that I have anticipated with a lot of joy, and time that I hope will be fruitful for all of us. I want to share with you um, the reading from John's Gospel, and I'm in the 16th chapter the 12th verse. So I'm going to share this reading and then recap in just a few moments. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you as we give you thanks and praise in this time of worship and celebration. In the name of Jesus Christ, our living Lord. Amen. Amen. One of the things that I celebrate with you today is 250 years of ministry as a church. Wow. Wow. And let's remember how it began going all the way back to that gospel reading. Jesus gave his disciples a lot of final instructions before leaving them. All four gospels have a version of his teaching, this same body of teaching in which he's giving final instructions to his followers. And John's by far is the most extensive as Jesus delivers quite a lot of information and three chapters worth in John's gospel to prepare the disciples for life without him physically among them. And it's from these final instructions of Jesus that we read these verses today, and I want to share a couple of them again. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own, but he'll speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. The disciples might have felt like they were cramming for a final exam in Discipleship 101. It was a lot to take in. It reminds me of the first time I was called upon to babysit for our granddaughter, Harper. Now, in the intervening years since we left, we have three granddaughters. Remind me to show you my pictures. And (laughs) Mia is almost six, Harper is now almost three, and we have baby Charlotte who is six months. So we just love having baby girls. And one of the things that I was excited about was taking care of Harper this first time when she was maybe three months old and her parents were going out to dinner for the first time in many months and I was positively thrilled with the prospect of hours alone with this sweet little bundle of joy. You know at three months they're smiling, they're cooing, they make all those wonderful little sounds and you think what a cherub, I can't get enough of this. 
Her mother wanted to walk me through all those final instructions before she left her precious child in the hands of her grandmother. So Lindsay told me she had two bottles ready for Harper. They were in the fridge, expressed earlier that day. And Harper might take only one, but she had a second one there just in case. And that just in case would become a refrain that I'd hear several times, right? After giving me the instructions about how to warm that, for, that bottle of milk and how to take the bag, actually it was, and insert it into the bottle to have it ready at just the right temperature and what to do in case I got it too warm and how to heat it again if it was not quite warm enough. <laughs> My head was swimming. You know, a little TMI here. Well then, <clears throat> the bedtime routine. And that was a little more complicated. <clears throat> now mind you, I had given birth to two daughters, <laughs> had reared them to reasonably healthy adults, but I had never done any of this as she shared it. I was reminded to change your diaper, of course, and to apply the cream that would reduce the threat of a rash, to make sure that she had a chin and a neck completely clean, otherwise she might develop eczema as she did last month, and then apply Thieves essential oil on her feet, and after that, a dose of vitamin D with that little tiny applicator, and I couldn't remember, because the two looked so similar, that little bottle of Thieves oil, I think was with a rolling applicator and the other one had a little squirt thing and into the mouth onto the feet <laughs> put on her sleep sack you know what that is a sleep sack <laughs> did you know that they zip from the top to the bottom so weird and put it on over her onesie then turn on the white noise on the snoo and then strap her into the snoo. Now, if you've never seen a snoo, looks like a straight jacket, friends. I mean, really. A and I couldn't hear anything else after that because all I kept thinking about is, you're gonna put this baby in a straight jacket? No way! Press the button on the snoo to begin the rocking motion. Turn out the light, take the monitor with you, and she'll probably be asleep in a matter of about a minute. Now, I wasn't about to hold my breath on that point. There is not an infant anywhere who goes right to sleep. But she did. Anyway, I was told, too, that if she wakes up, don't worry, she'll probably drift back to sleep because that snoo will detect her motion and will ramp up the rocking to soothe her. And I'm thinking, how do you soothe a baby just with rocking when she's in a straitjacket? <laughs> Made no sense to me. By now, my head is not just swimming, it is drowning in too much information. What about just holding a baby and rocking the baby and putting her down in the crib and patting her little bottom as she gets fussy? I tried to recall all those steps and realized I had retained very little. We were in trouble, but yet God was with us. Anyway, I think about how the disciples might have felt. When Jesus, in his own way, had shared all the information, all the instructions, all the ways that they were to live after he left them physically. And their capacity to hear was completely maxed out. All these instructions revealed the limits of their understanding of everything he came to do. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you. And he watched as their eyes were glazing over. But you cannot bear them now. And that was so very, very true. Like the anxious parent leaving his or her child for the first time, he wanted to make sure they had information to cover every contingency, just in case, right? Mercifully, when Lindsay left me alone with Harper, she said, call me if you need anything. And in those words, I found a lot of comfort because cell phones have a way of connecting us quickly and efficiently. And while Jesus didn't have a smartphone, he still was able to assure his friends, 
here's how you can reach me. Here's how you can reach me. And he didn't give them a number, but he gave them a name. The Spirit of Truth. And when the Spirit of Truth comes, he said, you know, we're reminded that in John's Gospel, in this same long season of, of instruction, Jesus had said about himself, I am the truth. So he was saying to the disciples, in effect, this spirit is me. And what the spirit teaches you is of me. The spirit speaks for me and speaks of what you need to know for your future. But most importantly, bottom line, he said to them, here's how you can reach me. 250 years ago, Joseph Pilmore came to America as an evangelist. He was under the direction of John Wesley. You know that name as the founder of Methodism, and Wesley remained in England, but his, his appointed people came to form Methodist communities here. And one of the things that we celebrate is that Pilmore found a group and assembled this group for prayer, for worship, for study, a group that would become faithful and mutually accountable to one another as followers of Jesus. It began in 1772, and look at what it's become. Look at what you have become. He wasn't ready to launch a church or appoint a pastor or to build a structure for the housing of this gathered community. No, there were none of those things that institutionalized the church in those days. But nevertheless, there was a community, a community of faith. And now, 250 years later, we can look back at what you've accomplished and look ahead to what faith can do. And while David and I had the privilege of walking alongside this congregation for five years, that was a very small part of this long history, but a significant part of ours. Because we remember a faithful community. We remember decisions that were made under the influence of this same Holy Spirit. We remember growth and outreach and pushing ourselves a little bit farther beyond the walls of the church and into the community, a partnership with local schools, attempts to feed the hungry, efforts to provide for the needs of those who were in poverty. I think we remember so many of those wonderful, beautiful experiences and evidences of your faithfulness because of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that I especially appreciated was um, following a hurricane, a devastating hurricane, Floyd. We found ourselves on an island, pretty much, safe and protected by big rivers and roads that still were navigable. But just five miles outside of the city, everything was underwater. And as a church, you led the effort of recovery. And some of you are too young to even know about that storm. That's mind-boggling, too. <laughs> but the truth is, that's a part of who you are. And that's a part of who you are with the spirit of truth. I also remember that Centenary had uh, an effort, had made an effort over and over and over again to include every member of the congregation and every friend of Centenary in a ministry of the church. And there were many ways to serve, but that was a concerted effort to engage people in this ministry that had been entrusted to the disciples in those final words of Jesus on the eve of his death. Well, I could say a lot more about the 250 years past, including those five that, that I shared with you. But I think one of the things I want to celebrate the most is one that I heard about only by going to your website and recognizing what you've done recently. Climax, 250 years, 
and a generous gift to four different ministries in the community, representing a tithe of a project that you took on to, to revitalize your own community. What a beautiful gift that reflects the love and not just the love, but, but the intention of God to create a beloved community and to open that community to all, one and all. I was just thrilled, <clears throat> excited, hopeful, delighted to see that the widows, orphans, the homeless, the hungry were a part of your reach beyond the walls and into the community. Thanks be to God for what you have done and continue to do. Well, at times, I hear this word from Jesus. When the spirit of truth comes, he will declare to you the things that are to come. And I wonder, did I miss a memo? The things to come. In your wildest imagination, could you have imagined a pandemic that would last two, two and a half years? In your vision of what would lie ahead, I don't know that I could have imagined worship in this space. <laughs> because I remember when it was a little more full of other stuff. You've done a lot to even prepare for this kind of a worship service, and I'm thankful for it. When the spirit of truth comes, he will declare to you the things that are to come. If I had known of gas prices' potential to soar, I might not have bought a big car. You know what I mean? What would you have done differently if you had been able to see around every corner? When Jesus offered this teaching, though, he wasn't trying to say, here's how you can get the best lottery tickets. He wasn't trying to say the Spirit will lead you into truth and things that are to come in such a way as to benefit you, but rather to benefit the community, to benefit the community. Now, it is true that the Spirit will lead us to the places of need, individually as well as corporately. The Spirit will lead us to the lonely one who needs to be invited to come and play. I'm so thankful for that lesson. The Spirit will lead us into a ministry that is calling for our gifts, again, that are given by the Spirit. The Spirit will do for individuals and for the church wonderful things. In his teaching, Jesus offered the spirit as a way to stay connected with him. And when the church is led into all the truth and declared to us, especially as a church, the things that are to come, in some ways we know generally there will be challenges. There will be suffering. There will be sacrifice. And as we're reminded in that wonderful passage from Romans, that's how we build character and endurance and hope. And hope does not disappoint us. When the spirit of truth is with us, we can navigate troubled waters, all kinds of troubled waters. Think about the pandemic. It was a challenge, indeed. And when I think about the struggles in the United Methodist Church today, again, a challenge. But if we go back to the first 50 years of the expressions of Christian movement. The first 50 years were filled with challenges, debates, disagreements over who could be baptized, who could be a part of the community. In the last 50 years, we've been debating sort of the same thing. But more particularly about sexuality in the church and faith. We have been a part of a community, God's beloved community, fractured with disagreements, and yet we've remained in mission together. So what about this next season, the future of the church? I don't know everything. I don't know everything around the corner. I can't see, but I do know that the Spirit can navigate, help us navigate these troubled waters. 
We remember that in those final instructions, Jesus told us a lot of things. And among them, this is my commandment, that you love one another. He said also, you did not choose me, but I chose you. He said as well, go and bear fruit. Go and bear fruit. Remaining tethered, remaining connected to the vine, Jesus. And we know that with these instructions, there's a lot that we can do. I remember in the beginning of the pandemic, and as congregations were asked to close and not gather for a season, we imagined maybe a few weeks and we'd be back. Weeks stretched into months, many months and I saw pastors and congregations developing creative ways to be the church. I was so impressed. Solutions to the disruption of worship and community life were met with things like daily devotions on Facebook. And they were wonderful messages. They were inspiring. They kept us grounded. They helped us to know that we weren't alone. I remember a pastor who offered drive-by, drive-up worship, drive-in worship, kind of like the drive-in movies. They had a drive-in worship experience. First time I saw one, I thought, that won't fly. How wrong was I? The Spirit led into ways of connecting the community. Without a doubt, conversations and coffee via Zoom meant bring your own coffee, but we are connected with one another. We're a community that loves one another. We want to see one another. We want to talk. We want to share. And these were some of the creative ways. But again, most of the congregations discovered that their reach into the world grew significantly as people from across the U.S., even across the pond, began to engage in online ministries and found it a safe place to explore spirituality. So many people identify with their secular culture and would be scared to death to cross the threshold of a church. You know some? I know a lot. And, and what we found is that the Spirit led us, the church, to use resources available to us today that weren't available in Jesus' day, but expanding our reach and bringing more people from a secular world into the spiritual one. Jesus couldn't have predicted that. Couldn't have said, and this is how you're going to do it in 2020. Detours. Life's detours take us away sometimes from familiar pathways. But we know how to navigate because we have the Spirit. We know the Spirit reflects what Jesus has taught us. John recorded all these words of Jesus to encourage the church to accept the Spirit as a guide. And we have to admit that the Spirit doesn't reveal new truth. The Spirit helps us reinterpret the truth we already know. As an example, just a month ago I was in Spain and I was walking the way of St. James. Remember James was one of the inner circle of Jesus' disciples? Peter, James, and John, they went up on the mountain with Jesus. They were there at his transfiguration. They were a part of special teaching moments with Jesus. And James knew that at the end of the season with Jesus as the leader of their band, he was ready, called, equipped to take up the mantle and carry this gospel where he was assigned. And he felt called to Spain. So James went to Spain, and pilgrims have walked the trail that uh, James walked for centuries now, and recalling the teachings of Jesus as James did himself. And after um, Jesus had shared his final instructions with the disciples, James carried this gospel to Spain on foot, even as in 2020 that gospel has gone into places online, and I find that the experience for me in Spain was to follow that journey and to remember how Jesus, 
by his spirit led James and leads us into places where we may not know the language, where we may not know the culture, where we may not know what we're getting into, but we're going and not alone. Well, as we drew near to Santiago, I'm going to give you now the real reason I'm telling this story. Uh, Six days into this trip, we were a group of 15 women who didn't know one another previously. We'd met as we gathered for the journey. And among the group, a few were beginning to feel tired. Well, that may not be a big surprise. We had walked 80 miles. But we weren't but six days in, right? They were tired, puny, a little achy. You know where this is going? They tested for COVID, and they were positive. I didn't have one symptom in the world, wasn't particularly worried, twice vaccinated, twice boosted, you know. Got it built up. Well, the defense systems don't always work. So I, too, tested positive for COVID. And that meant that most of us were having to delay our flights home to the U.S. Because airlines then required a negative test to board a plane to the U.S. You know what? That changes today today. Wish it had been a month ago, but no. United Airlines has a mission statement that's been in place for years, in fact, for decades. And the mission is this, connecting people, uniting the world. Well, for us, the connection was delayed, and the uniting with families and friends and jobs all had to be put on hold until we were shed of the virus. The company also has core values, And those core values have remained exactly the same, again, for decades. Safe, caring, dependable, and efficient transportation by air. Now, we could poke holes in some of those, right? As the airline, though, has reinterpreted their values and practices for the season of a pandemic, safety was addressed with a better ventilation system, better cleaning of the aircraft, and a requirement of a negative test for the virus. What was it 10 years ago? Do you remember? 20 years ago even? Well, a while back, you had to put anything liquid in a three ounce or less size jar and carry that on the plane. Weapons. We were screened for all kinds of weapons. What was the safety concern? How was safety interpreted then? Let's prevent hijackings and other physical threats. Well, in the same way that the airline has had to reinterpret their mission for a new day, Jesus is an unchanging word, and we live in a changing world. And the spirit of truth declares to us that the next 250 years for Centenary Church can be full of power, can be full of faith, can be full of hope, because the spirit is leading us. The next 250 years can be, as they have been thus far, a reflection of the kingdom of God, which was Jesus' most frequent theme and teaching a community of forgiveness and reconciliation, a community of love and hope, a community of gratitude and grace. There you have it. One of the things that I pray for is that our denomination will not be obliterated, but rather will become stronger because the Spirit is leading us, because the Spirit is reflecting and reminding us of all that Jesus said. And I find the words that are attributed to St. Patrick helpful in this journey, this moving forward. St. Patrick probably was mindful of those final instructions of Jesus as he embraced a risky and difficult mission of his own. He was going back to Scotland to proclaim this good news of Jesus Christ, the love of God that was so eager to pursue people who didn't know him. 
And, and Patrick was confident that Jesus was within reach because this is what he prayed. Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me and before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore. As Patrick prayed, so I pray for you, for all of us, that we may carry that good news, that love, to a broken and hurting world, but one that is longing for Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Carol. There are offering stations at the doorways, as well as a link in our bulletin and on our website, if you would like to contribute to our life together. Now let us offer ourselves to God and our gifts for the ministry of Jesus Christ. i
clap for that. That's absolutely yeah. fine to do. I'm going to clap because I had to play drums last week, and I, I, my fingers have been like swollen all week. I am just, I am rejoicing you're back. <laughs> Um, as we move into a time of joys and concerns, let me uh, just share a big congratulations to uh, all of those graduating this year, uh, both from our congregation. Uh, Grace graduated yesterday from high school. Uh, we have others who have graduated from middle school and preschool and all kinds of things, and, uh, and certainly extended to our friends this week. We uh, share congratulations with them. Uh, as for your prayers, next Sunday the youth will be uh, going to West Virginia, to Huntington, West Virginia for our mission trip this year. Uh, we'll be working with the residents of Harmony House again this year, as well as doing some other things uh, around the greater Huntington area. Uh, we are looking forward to that. A uh, couple of prayer concerns. I see Clyde uh, is not here this morning. Uh, you may have heard Martha um, uh, Shell, his wife, uh, had a relapse with her cancer and is starting treatments once again, and uh, they appreciate your prayers. Uh, also, prayers for Alice Ringley, who fell a couple of weeks ago and broke her arm. Uh, she's home and healing. Also, prayers for Mike Barnes, who's in the hospital here right now. Uh, we lift him up in prayer. He had some issues last week and then a low blood pressure issue uh, the latter part of the week, and uh, we just pray for his uh, strength and healing through this time. Are there other uh, joys or concerns to share this morning? I hear crickets. Let us go. Thank you. Uh, Jen left a few minutes ago. She, um, she broke her arm in three places last weekend after she fell. So um, uh, this was last Sunday night. She decided to go to the doctor Friday right before, you know, the weekend happens. And the orthopedics aren't around, so um, she'll be referred to that next week. So do keep her in your prayers. Uh, thank you. Appreciate you reminding me and keeping me out of, out of trouble. Lord of mysteries, we admit that sometimes we're confused by the concept of, of Trinity and what it means as we reflect on this Trinity Sunday. We can speak the words of three in one, but our minds are boggled and confused by the concept. You're so great and your work is so awesome that we try to find ways to express your work and witness in our lives. From before the beginning of time, you offered love and creative wisdom as you created all that is. In the very person and ministry of Jesus, you taught us more clearly about your nature, love, and gave us ways that we should live peacefully together. The Holy Spirit is offered as our guardian and guide, faithfully with us all of our days. And full and complete is your love for us, Again, part of your creation. Help us again, Lord, to be more faithful to you. Help us find the opportunities to witness and serve you. Heal and restore us. For we ask these things in the name of the creator, redeemer, and sustainer of all as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That is the King, the power, forever. Let's stand together and continue our time of praise. Will you please join me in, your, in our benediction? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.